the Starship orbital launch mount is slowly coming back to its full potential. The Starship launch pad and the launch mount sustained significant damage during the inaugural Starship test flight on April 20, creating a substantial crater on the pad. Since then, SpaceX has been working around the clock to fix the damage and rebuild the launch site. They installed a massive water-cooled steel plate under the launch pad two weeks ago to mitigate pad damage in the future. The steel plate system is designed to dump large amounts of water under the OLM to deflect the energy of the 33 Raptor engines of Super Heavy during liftoff. The water will be stored inside the storage tank set up behind the launch tower and pumped into the steel plates through delivery pipes with the help of high-pressure nitrogen gas stored inside several gas canisters. The water released under the launch mount, like a shower head, will cool the metal surface and simultaneously absorb energy from the booster engine plume during liftoff. Teams conducted the first ever steel plate water discharge test on July 17, shooting thousands of gallons of water from the steel plates with tremendous force. The short test carried out last Monday afternoon was a trial run, and it did not showcase the full potential of the deluge system. At full potential, the system could spray as much as 350,000 gallons of water during Starship launches. As depicted in this animation created by Ryan Hansen Space, the water discharged under the OLM will be directed away from the super heavy engines to prevent it from entering directly into the engine bells. More steel plate water discharge tests can be expected in the coming days. Eventually, SpaceX will conduct a super heavy static fire test at the same time as activating the water deluge system to test it against the force of the powerful Raptor engines. Unlike NASA's water deluge system, which pumps out 450,000 gallons of water to suppress the excessive acoustic energy generated during launches of its rockets, SpaceX's deluge system uses water to absorb energy from the rocket as it lifts off, with most of the water expected to be vaporized by the heat of the rocket engines. The failure to deploy such a deluge system during the April Starship launch resulted in significant damage to the launch pad and the scattering of debris and dust across a wide area. The incident even led to dust landing on surfaces in the nearby town of Port Isabel. As a consequence, Starship remains grounded pending an investigation, and the FAA is facing a lawsuit for allowing the launch to proceed without appropriate measures in place. SpaceX expects the new water deluge system to prevent such incidents during future missions. Furthermore, SpaceX will also pour a layer of high-strength Fondag concrete on the region outside the steel plates to ensure the pad is far more robust than it was previously. Concrete mixer trucks arrived at the launch site on Wednesday night to start pouring Fondag concrete. Several systems of the orbital launch mount were also put to the test this past week. The launch mount has 20 small quick-disconnect umbilical panels designed to supply every single one of the outer 20 Raptor engines of the booster with the propellants they need to begin the ignition process. Several gas discharge tests were performed last week to check the quick disconnect mechanism's performance. The launch mount is also equipped with a fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system, nicknamed FireX, designed to purge the orbital launch mount with high-pressure nitrogen gas and water. This will clean and prevent the accumulation of any volatile mixtures of methane and oxygen underneath the launch mount before engine ignition. This system is implemented to avoid incidents such as the one that happened during the spin prime test of Booster 7 on July 11 last year. SpaceX carried out a FireX system test run on Tuesday night. The discharge of a huge quantity of cryogenic fluids was observed at the launch site on the same night, along with venting from the launch mount and launch tower. It looks like SpaceX purged the pipes, valves, and manifolds that deliver propellants to the booster and ship. Teams have begun removing the scaffolding installed on the launch mount, indicating the majority of launch mount repair work has been completed. All recent activities at the Starbase launch site suggest that the launch pad will soon be fully ready to support the next round of Super Heavy testing and Starship launches. Super Heavy Booster 9 was moved from the build site to the launch site on Thursday morning. The booster has already completed five cryogenic proof tests and has all 33 Raptor engines installed to begin static fire testing. Compared to its predecessors, SpaceX has made several design improvements to Booster 9. Please check out my previous video to learn about those design upgrades in detail, link in the description. After arriving at the launch site, the booster was moved closer to the launch tower. The Starship quick disconnect arm was then retracted, and the tower arms were raised. Booster 9 was then moved in between the arms to begin lifting operations. Several hours later, the launch tower arms slowly lifted the booster and placed it on the launch mount. Venting was seen from Booster 9's methane tank on Friday morning, indicating that SpaceX has started getting the booster ready for pre-launch tests. With Booster 9 now on the pad, the static fire test campaign could start as soon as next week.
Initial testing will likely involve only a few booster engines, and the test campaign will end with a full 33-engine static fire. Booster 9's partner, Starship 25, is sitting on suborbital launch pad B. The ship successfully completed a six-engine static fire test last month. Once Booster 9 completes all its pre-launch tests, the next milestone will be a Starship full stack, followed by the orbital launch attempt. However, SpaceX needs to receive a launch license from the Federal Aviation Administration before attempting a launch. FAA officials are still investigating the events of the inaugural launch, including the failure of the automated flight termination system to immediately destroy the rocket when it tumbled out of control. A license will only be granted after the investigation is completed, and SpaceX makes the necessary adjustments as per the investigation report. Starship 27, parked at the Rocket Garden, was cut in half early Thursday morning. Ship 26 and 27 were the twin starships with no flaps, previously thought would be used to demonstrate starships on orbit fuel refilling capability. Since the scrapping has begun, it can be confirmed that Ship 27 will not be part of that technology demonstration mission. Meanwhile, the fate of Ship 26 is unknown. The ship has already completed two cryo-proof tests and has all six Raptor engines installed for static fire tests. So, it's unlikely that Ship 26 will also be scrapped like Ship 27. Super Heavy Booster 10, which was moved to the Massey's test site on July 7, underwent a cryogenic proof test on the 18th. It was the first time a Super Heavy prototype was subjected to cryo testing at Massey's. The Starship structural test stand with hydraulic rams was moved to the Starbase build site for Massey's last Tuesday night. The test stand was moved into the high bay on Thursday evening, and Starship 28 was lifted and placed atop the test stand. Hours later, Ship 28 and the test stand left the build side and moved towards Massey's. The hydraulic rams are designed to exert force on the aft dome of starships during cryo-proof tests to simulate the thrust of Raptor engines. Ship 28 will be subjected to cryogenic proof tests at Massey's in the coming days, as hydraulic rams mimic the Raptor engine's thrust on the aft dome. Starship Gazer recently spotted a stainless steel section at the build site that looks like the Starship interstage ring. The ring features customized truss work with openings for the Starship's exhaust to escape during hot staging. Compared to the ring spotted in May, this new ring has less material and more openings. But it has more space that could be used to incorporate stringers with the forward section of the booster. Please be aware that SpaceX has not officially confirmed the interstage design, and the final design could differ from these two ring sections spotted at Starbase. SpaceX has begun stacking Starship 30 inside the high bay. The nose cone of Ship 30 was stacked atop the payload bay section on July 21. The new mega bay construction is progressing at the build site. The fourth and final corner section of the fourth level of the new mega bay was installed last week. Once complete, the new mega bay will have seven levels in total. A jib was recently moved to the build site to extend the crane that lifts the new mega bay sections. The jib will raise the crane's lift height to stack the next mega bay segments. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. Rocket Lab launched its 39th Electron mission on Tuesday, July 18, from Launch Complex 1B in New Zealand. The mission, dubbed Baby Come Back, was in reference to their latest attempt to recover the first stage booster. Stage separation happened about two and a half minutes after liftoff, and the booster descended toward Earth at a speed of nearly 9,000 km per hour, reaching a temperature of 2,400 degrees Celsius along the way. The booster initially deployed its drogue parachute, followed by the main chute, and ultimately splashed down in the Pacific Ocean about 17 minutes after liftoff. Rocket Lab recovery teams retrieved the booster from the ocean and brought it onto a vessel using a specially designed capture cradle. The recovery is part of Rocket Lab's ongoing work to make the Electron first stage reusable. Initially, Rocket Lab planned to use a helicopter to catch frilling boosters, and they even tried it once. However, the company ultimately decided against a helicopter in favor of the less complicated ocean splashdown method. Engineers will examine the recovered booster over the next few weeks to learn how its various parts perform during the ferocious return through Earth's atmosphere. Meanwhile, the Electron upper stage continued its flight into orbit. After an initial burn of the rocket's kick stage, it deployed four NASA Starling CubeSats and two Spire CubeSats into a 575km sun synchronous orbit. After two more burns, the kick stage deployed the final payload, Telesat's LEO-3 satellite, into a 1,000km orbit. The four Starling satellites will test the ability of spacecraft to operate autonomously as a swarm, flying in formation and maneuvering without commands from the ground. 
The two Spire satellites will join the company's constellation of more than 100 spacecraft, equipped with radio occultation payloads, for gathering meteorological data. LEO-3, the largest spacecraft on the launch, is a demonstration satellite allowing the Canadian satellite operator, Telesat, to continue testing its upcoming lightspeed network, which aims to deliver affordable and quality internet everywhere. Rocket Lab said its next Electron launch will take place on July 28, and it will be a dedicated mission for Capella Space to launch the first of their next-generation Acadia satellites. After exceeding its planned life in orbit, European Space Agency's Aeolus Wind satellite is on its way back to Earth. Aeolus, launched in August 2018, is the first satellite with equipment capable of measuring global wind speeds to improve weather forecasting. The spacecraft has been in orbit around our planet for the last five years, far exceeding its intended three-year mission. Although Aeolus was designed as a research mission and to demonstrate novel technology, it has been so successful that for most of its life in orbit, it provided data to Europe's leading meteorology centers, significantly improving global weather forecasts. Having surpassed all expectations, Aeolus's fuel is now almost spent, and the mission is coming to an end. Aeolus is currently being lowered from its operational height of 320 km by gravity, the grabbing wisps of the Earth's atmosphere, as well as solar activity. The satellite was never designed for a controlled re-entry, so under normal circumstances, it would naturally fall back to Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. However, ESA is going above and beyond by attempting the first of its kind assisted re-entry. Engineers at ESA's Space Operations Center in Germany will use the remaining fuel to steer Aeolus during its return to Earth. The first set of maneuvers, scheduled for July 24, will lower the spacecraft's perigee from 280 to 250 kilometers. A second set of maneuvers on July 27 will further lower the perigee to 150 kilometers. A final maneuver on July 28 will lower the satellite to 80 kilometers, and it will then burn up over the Atlantic Ocean. Models show that up to 20% of Aeolus, which weighs about 1,100 kilograms, will survive the re-entry. Many months of expertise have gone into planning this assisted re-entry mission. If successful, it will set a new standard for satellite re-entry and space junk mitigation. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.